Welcome to another episode of Eric Witt Whiskey Studies and in this video I'm going to talk about barley. This is uh, the first video in a series on Scotch malt whiskey production. So as you may already know there are four basic grains that are used to uh, produce Scotch whiskey namely malted barley, corn which they refer to as maize, uh, wheat and occasionally rye. Barley is used in making both Scotch malt whiskey and Scotch grain whiskey as it provides needed enzymes in grain whiskey production. All Scotch malt whiskey is made from three basic ingredients. Malted barley, water, and yeast. While most distillers prefer to use Scottish barley, they have no legal requirement to do so, which is wise given the varieties of Scottish climate. Most distillers believe the variety does not have any impact on flavor, although some believe a strain called Golden Promise does impart a certain mouthfeel to their spirit. Barley is the most widely adapted cereal in the world, grown closer to the poles and at higher elevations than any other cereal. Barley is a cool climate crop cultivated in the spring and summer. Barley grows best on well-drained soil in relatively cool conditions, especially cool nights and with 500 to 1000 millimeter or 20 to 40 inches of annual rainfall. Barley is considered to be the most drought and salinity tolerant of all the small grains. Although barley is widely adapted, yields vary widely based on climate and soils. The best non-irrigated growing conditions in the world are in Northern and Central Europe, typically a cooler climate region with adequate natural rainfall. So while there's barley grown on Isla and the western side of Scotland, uh, it doesn't grow as well on, as on the eastern side of Scotland and all the way down into England. So if a distillery on Scotland uses 100% malted barley from Scotland, usually it's coming from the east coast, as the west coast is far too uh, damp. Also, it's noted that uh, some local barleys on the west side, from the west side, can be a little bit more challenging to mill because due to the climate, the barley tends to be really, really, really small. Springbank, for example, does a local barley and they have to make special adjustments to the mill uh, uh, in order to adequately uh, grind it or mill it. And so it can be a little more fussy in milling. Most conversations I've heard on the topic of barley strains tend to emphasize the grain's ability to produce starch, sugar, and thus a greater volume of alcohol, not any particular flavors they contribute to the spirit. And this is a highly debated topic. You know, the whole subject of terroir, uh, Marc Rainier, who used to be at uh, Brucolati Distillery, now at Waterford on Ireland, has done these experiments in which he has demonstrated that different fields with different aspects to the sun uh, re result in different flavor flavoristics, flavoristics, flavor characteristics, or flavoristics as I like to call it, uh, in the barley. The challenge though is, uh, while as a primary flavor coming from the barley, fermentation, whether you go long or short, can have huge impact on the barley. Shorter is maltier and nuttier, longer, more fruity and floral. And what kind of yeast you use and whether you use uh, a louder mash tun or a rake and plow and on and on. And then distillation, of course, whether or not it's peated and then aging and then the casks. Casks provide 60, 70, somewhere in that range, depending on how much time and what type of cask it's been in uh, uh, the flavors. So, does the uh, strain of barley make a difference? Yeah, not that much. In the meantime, let's have a little uh, nosing of the Glengarry. So, I have read Glengarry may be doing some changes and actually reinstituting their malting floor. Currently, there are eight distillers with malting floors, only Springbank doing 100% of their own malted barley from the malting floor. But Glengarry may be reviving their malting floor. We'll see how that goes. There is a view that barley does not have a huge influence on the final state of the whiskey 
and that it, the key contribution a barley strain makes is in the amount of liters of alcohol each ton of grain yields. But some distillers do not share this view and are investing time and effort resurrecting older strains of barley that are not as high yielding as modern strains, but that they believe make for a higher quality malt spirit. However, most distilleries believe that the variety does not have an impact on flavor, although some do feel that a strain called Golden Promise does impart a different mouthfeel in their spirit. According to the Scottish Barley Database, there are at least 682 different varieties or strains of barley, but only 10 strains are presently approved for use in Scotch whiskey production by the Institute of Brewing and Distilling. So the 10 varieties that are typically approved um, are recognized change every year. They tend to test them to see what the starch yield is like and for disease resistant. So it's basically, hey, what are the top 10 uh, barley strains for this particular year? And so what they're currently using may change. Some varieties of barley are rejected for malting, usually due to high protein content. These are often grown to produce other grain products or used as feed for livestock. New barley varieties are continuously being tested in the pursuit of higher yields, while lower yield varieties such as Oxbridge, Prisma, Chariot, Triumph, and Golden Promise are rarely used. As these strains were all developed from the same original barley, Hordium disticon, as in Latin, they're all very similar in flavor, so changing the variety has little effect on the flavor of the finished whiskey. Most of the barley used in Scotch whiskey production is grown on the Scottish and English East Coast, where the light sandy soils and lower rainfall provide ideal growing conditions. Spring barley is typically sown from December until late April, and due to being fairly frost sensitive, it is sown later in Scotland than in the more clement areas of England. While some distillers only use Scottish grown barley, there is not enough barley grown in Scotland to meet the requirements of the country's whiskey industry. Consequently, barley is routinely purchased from England, other parts of Europe, and Canada. I did a review of the Glengarry 12 year old. Really, really nice. It's sweet up front, a little bit more savory on, on the back end. Typical sherry notes in terms of like dried oranges, but they get a real nice sort of a Tootsie Roll chocolate in the center. It has a nice creamy texture mouthfeel. Can be challenging to find some time, but I really, really like this whiskey. Two row versus six row barley. Barley tends to be divided into two general categories, spring barley and winter barley, and be either two or six row. Malt whiskey distillers seek barley strains with a low nitrogen content that is high in starch, large grain size, good enzyme potential, and has the ability to germinate. They also want barley that is easily malted, so maltsters prefer two row to six row barley due to its more consistent grain size. Two row spring barley also has a lower protein content than six row barley, so it contains more starch. The starch content reduces as the protein content increases. The level of nitrogen in the grain indicates the percentage of protein present, so malt whiskey distillers favor strains with a low nitrogen content, usually specifying between 1.2 to 1.65% by weight with a 1.5% considered optimum. A high starch content is required as this will be converted to sugar to fuel fermentation. 60 to 65% starch content is typical for modern barley varieties. Conversely, high nitrogen barley is used in the production of grain whiskey or as animal feed. Distillers also prefer barley with high diastatic power, also known as diastatic activity or enzymatic power, which refers to the amount of enzymes produced during germination, particularly alpha and beta amylase, which convert starch into sugar, so allowing sugars to be extracted from the starch in the barley during, during mashing. 
Other enzymes are also key to alcohol production, performing tasks such as breaking long proteins into short ones. Modern two-row spring barley varieties provide farmers a high yield of around three tons per acre, while also giving distillers a high potential alcohol yield of over 400 liters per ton. Modern barley varieties are also short growing, so better able to cope with the windy Scottish climate than taller traditional varieties such as Golden Promise, which only yields two tons per acre. Typically, spring barley varieties produce 19 to 24 grains per ear, fewer than in winter barley, resulting in yields about 20% less, although the difference is smaller in barley varieties grown in the north of Great Britain than in the south. Barley is graded on a scale of 1 to 9 for quality and consistency of grain size, with only the top three grades malted for use in whiskey production. Some resources state that no winter barley varieties are presently approved for distilling in the UK. However, it is reported that Inch Dyerney Distillery in the Lowlands incorporates five flavor innovations, including the highly unusual use of winter as well as spring barley. Worldwide, the primary use of winter barley is animal feed. However, winter barley may be grown as a cover crop and in the USA, its highest market value comes from the malting and brewing industries. So, one of the challenges in studying whiskey and getting into the nitty gritty here, you can read five books or five online resources and come up with five different answers and conclusions and opinions and views on this. So, you always have to take anything you study and particularly get more specific uh, about some areas of studying in Scotch whiskey with a little grain of salt uh, because there are a variety of opinions and you may hear things oftentimes that are quite contradictory. So what I'm presenting here for the most part is a general consensus from I think some of the best resources that I have. Barley anatomy. The three basic elements of barley are the germ, the endosperm, and the husk. Some sources break it down just to the uh, germ and endosperm. The scutellum is the leaf shield of the barley. During steeping, water enters the germ and into the aileron layer, which produces an enzyme, cytase, that breaks down the cell walls in the endosperm, which makes starch available for growth. The endosperm contains starch in the form of granules, which are embedded in a protein matrix which is surrounded by a cell wall. Starch, which beer producers and whiskey makers turn into sugar, is located in the endosperm, which provides a seedling food for it photosynthesized and grows leaves and is surrounded by a bran layer, which uh, is principally the husk. So if you take your hand and you go like this, you basically have the shape of a barley strain. So water comes into the front. On the outside of the barley strain uh, is the husk. And underneath the husk is the aileron layer. The water comes into the germ, the front part of the barley strain, goes into the aileron layer, and the aileron layer begins to release enzymes, which are gonna break down cell walls so that to release the starch, and there's en another enzyme, enzyme, which we're gonna get to in a second, will start to convert that starch into sugar. The husk is not a throwaway. It's a very important part of the barley, as we'll get into when we're looking at uh, making the wort. And that green layer, that's the uh, scutellum, uh, is part of the natural growth of the plant, and it doesn't have any particular role uh, in terms of making uh, scotch whiskey or beer. Another set of enzymes called amylase, or also known as diacetase, breaks down the protein matrix and converts the starch into soluble form known as dextrin. So if you take a um, salting cracker, you know, a cracker that has, has starch in it, put it into your mouth and let it sit in your mouth and eventually your, the saliva in your mouth, which contains amylase, will start to break down the starch in your mouth and convert it into sugar. So you can experience uh, what the barley experiences in malting in your mouth if you just uh, suck on a cracker.
The dextrin is then turned into sugar water or wort, which is then fermented to become a beer and then distilled. Steeping the barley. When the barley arrives at the distillery, it has about 12 to 14% moisture content. The water content needs to be increased so the barley is steeped in water for 48 hours with varying periods of being in and out of the water. After steeping, the water content is about 42 to 45% moisture content. It is then ready for malting. Malting the barley. In malting, the enzymes break down the cell walls and break open the protein matrix and create enough enzymes to turn starch into sugar. Before the growing plant consumes all of the glucose, the growth is stopped by kilning. Otherwise, all of the glucose would be consumed. During kilning, if peat is used for fuel, the barley will absorb peat reek, mostly on the husk, some of which is lost during mashing, distilling, and at the spirit bank in the second distillation and in maturation of the spirit. The phenolic compounds of peated barley are measured in parts per million. And I've generally found that uh, the PPM and, and barley uh, during uh, peating and the end result after maturation is about three to one. So if you have you know 60% or 55% peated barley and you wanna know what the, uh, you know, what's the PPM level in the bottle, uh, just do a three to one math in terms of the reduction. Destoning the harvested barley. When the barley is brought in from the fields, it may be accompanied by mob material other than barley, such as small rocks, glass, and high density matter from the stream of grain. Consequently, before putting the grain through the barley mill, it goes to a destoner, which sifts the grain and uses magnets to remove any metal parts. All right, so that's it. And I'm looking at barley. We're gonna pick it up from here. In our next video, we're gonna look at milling. Now some mills, we're gonna get ahead of the game. Uh, some mills have a destoner connected to it or above it. So it's not separate. It's, it's not treated as separate from just um, processing the, the barley. It basically goes into a hopper, and the hopper into a destoner, and then the destoner into the mill. But we're going to get more into that in our next video. All right. Uh, if you've not already, I'd ask that you subscribe, uh, like this video, and uh, give it a thumbs up. And if you have any comments or questions, leave them down below. Until next time, cheers. Hey, don't forget to subscribe and check out these other whiskey videos.